God bless you. It's good to know that Jesus is here. According to his promise in his word, he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. And we just pray that he'd find welcome with us this morning. God bless you. Before we bow our heads to pray, I just have a, an update. I got an update from Sister Suzanne just a minute ago. Uh, I talked to Brother Bob yesterday, and he was good to talk to on the phone. She sent a report last evening, and he had turned the corner, was feeling better, breathing better, ate a good meal, rested. And this morning, he is up and walking. His oxygen level staying up above 90. He's walking the halls. And he's anxious to get home. Amen. But they're wanting to wean him down off of the stairway so they can send him home. So just pray that they're able to do that so he can get home. Also, I found out yesterday that they had to take Brother Clayton Gatchel to the hospital because his oxygen level, he couldn't keep it up in the 90s, so they were going to start him on steroids. So I haven't heard. I spoke to him yesterday. He was doing all right on the oxygen they had him on, but we want the same thing for Brother Clayton. Amen. What God does for one, he can do for all if we can approach him with the same faith. Let's just bow our heads and take this to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the good report, Lord, from our Brother Bob. Lord, you're such a faithful Savior and healer, Lord. 
you keep your word and you do what no man can do. And we thank you, God, for the testimony that came from our sister Suzanne and how you took care of her. She's feeling so well, and now Brother Bob's doing so well. Lord, you're a faithful God. We just want to worship you and thank you for your goodness. And we want to lift our brother Clayton before you, Lord, and pray that you would do the same for him, Lord, that you give him a rapid recovery. May he start to feel well and be able to go home soon and recover at home with his family. Lord, I pray there'd be yet another testimony that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, as we turn our hearts to your word this morning, I pray that you would take control that we could yield preeminence unto you and you would take it, Lord, and that you would be the one that breaks the bread of life, that you would speak eternal words through vessels of clay. God, that we may give you the preeminence and that you may take it amongst us and teach us your word and that we might see you like we've never seen you before. We love you, Father. We yield ourselves unto your hand and ask that you be blessed in all we do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. While we're standing, let's just turn to the book of Colossians and look in Colossians chapter 1. And I'd also like to make an announcement. We have another little baby that was born by the grace of God into the assembly. Amen. Thursday night, uh, Aaron and Samantha Small welcomed Micah Zachary Small. Amen. God be praised. Amen. Let's just give the Lord a hand and thank God for a safe delivery. Amen. God is so good. Amen. So we're thankful she squeezed it in this year because we've had a lot of babies. We needed another one. Amen. So it worked out good. Amen. Also want to remind you of the meetings up at Brother Dan Ratliff's in near Ann Arbor, Michigan this weekend. Brother Ben will be preaching up there Saturday and Sunday. Amen. Let's take a look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 25. says, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. God bless you as you're seated. Amen. I don't know how many times we've read that scripture. I, don't, I couldn't imagine maybe hundreds of times, but it always brings me joy to read that scripture, amen? That is a passage of scripture Brother Benham opens with when he preaches Christ is the mystery of God revealed, and we know that there's been a mystery hid from the foundation of the world, the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I pray that God will help us to understand that, that scripture become more of a reality day by day, amen, and hour by hour in our lives. I'd like to read just a little bit out of Christ as the mystery of God revealed, amen. Right after Brother Branham reads that portion of scripture, he says, now for a text I want to take out of there, this for a text, basing it upon the entire Bible, but I want us to... I want us to title this, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Christ being the mystery of God revealed. Amen. We've talked many, many times and talked about this, that if we we hear what Brother Branham's wanting to say, but we get the wrong mental picture from the beginning, then we're going to miss the rest of what he's bringing us in this message. For he's telling us he wants to base, he reads that for a text, but he wants to base this sermon upon the entire Bible. So he's going to be preaching the entire Bible, and he wants to title it, Christ is the mystery of God revealed, Christ being the mystery of God revealed. Now, if, we, if in our minds, as soon as he says that, we picture, amen, the vessel of Jesus Christ, the body that God exp- expressed himself in, and we limit everything he's going to say to that one manifestation, amen, then we're going to miss the rest of the message. But we have to understand when he's talking about he's preaching the entire Bible, and in the entire Bible, Christ is the mystery of God revealed, and it's Christ, amen, the anointed word for each age, revealing God through the entire Bible. 
So it was, all of that was wrapped up in Jesus Christ. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He was the full expression in one vessel of all of that truth was expressed there. But it wasn't the only place it was expressed. It was also expressed down through the Bible. Amen. And it was it's continually being expressed that Christ is the mystery of God revealed, even being expressed in our day. So we can't start... Amen. This understanding, uh, th this message with the wrong mental picture. Amen. We have to have the right mental picture. Then we're going to understand what Brother Branham's telling us. Amen. So Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Amen. And it's based on the entire Bible. He said, now, I took it in order of Sunday school lessons so we could all read together and have this fellowship together. Now, God's secret mystery he had before the world began. Now, back in the back part of God's mind, there was something there was something that he was trying and was going to achieve, and he had a motive in doing it in order to let himself be expressed. So, so it's, it's self-explanatory, but God has had a plan. Nothing in the Bible and nothing through time is happening haphazardly. There's so many things that look like they're, they're, they're in chaos and they're just happening and, and things are happening and then there's reactions to actions and, and all of it. In our perspective, from an earthly perspective, it looks chaotic, amen? We can even look at our lives and things that happen to us and it looks chaotic. But Brother Branham said there's nothing out of kilter. There's, everything's just right on time. The clock's ticking right on time with God's plan and nothing happens to a predestinated son or daughter of God without first God giving approval for him because we see that in the book of Job when Job was going through his crisis and God giving approval God was in control of Job's trial is that right and God was in control of Job's trial he was putting limits and boundaries and permissions amen to the devil and so God was showing us in Job that he is in control amen even when we come into the dark ages and and we see that 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 there's a voice that comes from in, in the in the I think it's the third seal under the black horse rider there there is a voice that comes from the throne amen it says that her a penny of wheat for a measure and a penny of barley for a measure see thou her not the oil and wine. Amen. And, and that voice coming from the midst of the throne, amen, was the voice of the lamb. The lamb was in control even in the dark ages. There was persecutions in the church and, and there was difficulties that they were going through and, and the true Christianity was almost wiped out then, but the lamb was still putting boundaries on the trial. So it looks like sometimes we look at our lives and it looks like chaos. We're standing in situations sometimes we don't know if it's going to go right or if it's going to go left. We're standing here and we ourselves have no idea what the next step is going to be and it looks like there's no solution. Oh, I don't know if you've ever lived long enough to get into a position where you could not see a solution. If you ever did and you're here now, you've been in a good place. Because you find that God brings a solution where you never expected a solution. God knows the next step, but he knew the next step before the foundation of the world. It's us who didn't understand. And so that's been the problem with the Bible and Bible scholars for all these years is because we had limited perspective trying to understand and make sense out of what we read in the Bible. And we've looked at it. Amen. It's, it's like trying to... Uh, I, I say it this way, it's like trying to understand eternity looking through a peephole. You get a little view of this, and then maybe you get a little view of that, but you can never see the whole picture. Amen? That's why God in the end time came and opened the seals and took the seals off of the Bible so we can get more than a peephole view here in this book and in this book and in this book. Amen? That's what Brother Branham's doing in Christ is the mystery of God revealed. He's coming after the seals, and he's trying to take the peephole off of Abraham and the people off of Noah, and the people off of the judges, and he's trying to back up and say, this is all the same thing. This is all expressing the same thing. It's expressing what was in the back part of God's mind before the foundation of the world. And he's allowed all of this, and each one of it has been expressing himself. He's done all of this so that he can express himself. So, so when we see this picture, amen, the Bible then becomes a new book. I'm going to turn over here a couple paragraphs later and continue reading. It says, now God had a purpose and a hidden mystery. 
And that's what I want to speak on to the church this morning, the hidden mystery of God that he had in his mind before the world ever began and how it's unfolded itself right down to this present hour that we're living. Then you will understand clearly, then you'll see on what I believe what is being done. So Brother Branham comes and he tells us uh, the, the mind that was in God has been unfolding itself right down to this hour. So the Bible has been the unfolding of God's mind. It's been the plan that he had. It's been the thought that he wanted to express, the thing that he desired to achieve. He's been unfolding it down through time, amen, and bringing it out, amen. And then in the end time, he takes the veil off of it so he can express or he can explain what's been in the back part of his mind so that we can look back and see how perfect everything has been. So now nothing's haphazard. We understand that. He said, then... It's unfolded itself right down to this present hour that we're living. Then you will understand clearly. Then you see on what I believe what is being done. So Brother Ram's telling us we need this revelation to see what's happened so we can see what's being done. So we would understand our day and its message. It's a God's great mystery of how it's a secret. He kept it a secret. Nobody knew nothing about it. Even the angels didn't understand it, see, he didn't reveal it. That's the reason under our seventh mystery, when the seventh seal was open, there was silence. Jesus, when he was on earth, they wanted to know when he would come. He said, even the son himself don't know when it's going to happen. See, God has this all to himself. It's a secret. And that's the reason there was silence in heaven for a space of half hour. And seven thunders uttered their voices, and John was even forbidden to write it. See, the coming of the Lord. That's one thing he hasn't revealed yet of how he will come and when he will come. It's a good thing that he doesn't know. He has showed or revealed it in every type that's in the Bible. Now you'll understand why he said, I take from my text the entire Bible. Because there's been a great secret in the back part of God's mind. And that secret has to do with the coming of Christ. And, and, and that's been unfolding itself all the way down to this time. Amen. And he hasn't come out plainly and told it. No, he couldn't do that. He must keep it in a mystery form. Amen. But he's showed it in every type that's in the Bible. So Brother Branham now is preaching the entire Bible. But he's preaching this secret. So I'd like to title this this morning, if I can, The Mystery in Plain Sight. The Mystery in Plain Sight, because it's been unfolding itself in the Bible. It's been typed in the Bible. It's been declared in the Bible. That's why when Brother Bram comes to the seven seals, he, he's talking before he comes to the preaching of the seven seals, and he's talking about the seals inside the book and the seals on the back side of the book. And he says, you know, we can see the seals on the inside, and he's talking about, you know, uh, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 6, when you see the opening of the seals, you see a white horse go forth and a red horse. Hey, man, he's showing that as the seals on the inside of the book, but there's seals on the back side or outside the book. He said that never written in the Bible at all because he's looking at the the seven thunders and tying it to Revelation chapter 8, the seventh seal where there's silence in heaven and John was forbidden to write, nothing written, nothing spoken. And Brother Branham said it's not even written in the Bible at all. That's what he's saying in 1960 and 61, amen. But by the time that he comes around to preaching the seals, amen, he has a greater understanding and he's saying, no, it can't, you can't add to it for this is the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. So the seals have to be in here. But God just didn't declare it, amen. He didn't allow John to write the seven thunders, which was the revelation contained in the seven seals, but he had him seal it up. But it still has to be in the Bible. So now Brother Branham comes to this great mystery of Christ, amen, the seventh seal, and he tells you there is silence in heaven, nothing's written, but it's written in every type that's in the Bible. So it's a mystery hiding in plain sight. Amen. Amen. He goes on and he says, he has showed or revealed it in every type that's in the Bible. Therefore, the entire Bible is the revelation of God's mystery in Christ. The entire Bible is an expression of one goal that God had, one purpose he wanted to achieve in the entire Bible, and all the acts of the believers in the Bible has been in type and expressing what God's great goal is, and now in this last day he has revealed it and shows it. 
Amen. Brother Bam didn't say we're hoping he'll reveal it and we're hoping he'll show it. But Brother Branham says here in the last day, he has revealed it and shows it. So God's great goal is, so now I, I just say it this way, basing off this statement Brother Branham makes in Christ is the mystery of God revealed. If we're still at the spot where we're wanting God to show us or reveal the seventh seal and show us and reveal the seven thunders, he's telling us that he's already revealed it and shows it in the last day. So if we're in that place where we're looking for something, I would, I, would, I would admonish all of us, let's go back to the message, amen? Let's go back to the Bible because it's already been revealed, it's already been shown. It's in the message. So let's not stay in the hoping he'll show something he's already revealed and he already shows it. So let's go back to that message and say, God, you have to show me what you showed and you have to reveal to me what you revealed. Amen, because I'm not looking for another messenger, I'm not looking for a new message. I'm not looking for the hidden message that didn't get on tape. And we find in the archive somewhere the one that Brother Brandon preached that explains it all, and we've missed it for 50-some years. No, I'm not waiting for that. He has already revealed, and he already shows it. So I need to go back and say, God, give me eye salve, amen. Give me ears to hear. Lord, you've already opened the seals. You've already revealed it in the ministry, amen, of that seventh angel. God, help me to reveal to me what you revealed and show me what you've shown and if we can go with that attitude, then you're going to see it keeps opening up and keeps opening up. It's all there. It's all there. So, so he goes on to say, and now in this last day, he has revealed it and shows it. And God's help will see it right here this morning. That's why I carry this book everywhere I go. Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Brother Ben said, when I preach this, I'm preaching the entire Bible. This is the mystery that God had in the back part of his mind. He wants to reveal it. I, I take from my text the entire Bible. I'm going to preach to you Christ is the mystery of God revealed. He shows it in every time. It's been revealed. It's been shown what was in the back part of God's mind. And with God's help this morning, I hope you'll see it. That's why I never leave home without this book. And every time I get to sit down, I keep going back to this book. Amen. Because Brother Branham tells us what he's going to tell us. And I said, God, help me to see what you've been telling us. And God's help will see it right here this morning, what the Lord has had in his mind all along and has expressed it. What's Brother Benham going to talk about this, during this message? What God has had in his mind all along and has expressed it. That's the mystery, the goal, the plan, the purpose, the one thing that God wanted to achieve. And Brother Benham's going to preach about it. And Christ is the mystery of God revealed. I love it. That's why I said in the beginning, you can't start this message with the wrong mental picture or else you'll never get to what he's trying to express. We'll see it in one portion of the manifestation when God was all wrapped up in one vessel in Jesus Christ in the 2,000 years. We'll see it there, but we'll miss it before and we'll miss it after. But we've got to see it through the whole thing. Now he says, therefore, you can see the great meaning of what it's been to know this and then try to bring it to the people. And then you, I haven't went into details to try to explain it as God has revealed it to me. So Brother Benham has already received the revelation. He hasn't went in great detail yet to try to explain it. But with God's help, he was going to try to show it this morning. Praise be to God. I think we can all read that book again. Listen to that tape. Now, I'm going to read a few quotes and, and, and get into the, what I desire to get into here, but I want to uh, set some background. He said, in trying to do God a service without it being God's will, he said, now he reveals these things by his foreknowledge to those who he has ordained to these things. Otherwise, they don't see it. Standing right there, looking right at it, and he can't see it. Now, how many ever seen the picture of a cow in the bush that you just have to look and look? And did you ever see that or seen the picture of Christ in a bush or in the sky or clouds? See, that painter has got that so fixed up till you have to look at it just a certain way. Well, then when you once see it, you can't see nothing else but that. This is going to become really important. Amen. Once you see it, you can't see nothing else but that. Every time you look, there it is. How many seen those pictures? Well, sure you have. Well, that's the way Christ is himself, the gospel, the messages. When you once see the message of the hour, there's nothing else you can see but that. 
Amen. So once you, once you catch this revelation Brother Benham's talking about, once you see the picture that he's talking about, that's the only thing you can see. Amen. You can't see nothing else. So when we go back to read our Bible, this is why Brother Benham could say after preaching the seals, my Bible became a new book. Amen. And we're talking about a prophet of God with prophetic insight on the word. And he had prophetic insight on the word for his duration of his ministry. Amen. There's things he preached in the 50s that he confirms in the opening of the seals. So the man had prophetic insight on the word. He knew his Bible thoroughly. Amen. Some people, you know, Brother Bram makes that comment. He said, you know, somebody told him, but Brother Bram, you don't know your Bible very well. He said, that may be true, but I know the author real well. Well, that's true. He knew the author, but Brother Bram knew this Bible. He knew this Bible. When Brother Brandon is preaching, he may not always be quoting a Bible verse, but he's always preaching the Bible. He knows this, he's, he knows this Bible. Uh, he knows it better than grammar. If I could say it that way, I'm probably not saying that right, but he knows it better than grammar. He knows it better than English. He knows it better than Greek or Latin. He knows it better than that. Amen. It wasn't, it wasn't the jot and tittles and pen marks that he knew. He knew the very nature, life, character of this word. Brother Branham could read a story about a, a character in the Bible, and out of that, he could clean, a, could clean a concept about God and carry that concept from that story and start preaching it. Amen. And it sounds like that maybe he's misquoting the scripture, or may, maybe he uh, uh, doesn't remember the details just right. So he's saying, no, he has caught the very core of what that, t- that character is showing us, or what that circumstance in the Bible is showing us, and he's preaching us the core meaning of that story. And then somebody will look at the prophet and say, well, you know, he got that detail wrong and that wasn't how many people and, and it, it really wasn't in that chapter in the Bible. And I'm saying, my goodness, what does it matter? Amen, you can know the chapter, the verse, the jot and the tittle and have no idea what expressing, what God is expressing from his heart, amen, to his children. And that is where Brother Benham knew this Bible like nobody I've ever seen know this Bible. He knew the heart of the Bible, the mind of the Bible, the character of the Bible, the life coming through the Bible. And everything he preaches, preaches that life, that character, that nature. So people want to stumble over mis- mispronunciations and mislocations and, and, and partial scriptures and don't stumble at all. Get to the heart of the matter. What is God trying to say? So once you see this message, when you see the message of the hour, there's nothing else you can see but that. That's all. Everything else is gone. The rest of it's just a filler. See, when you once see this message, when you once see this message, I mean when you see it, amen, not see, you know, that we got 1,200 and some tapes and churches here and there. We had a prophet and he lived from this year. I'm talking about seeing the message. That's not seeing the message. That's looking at historical accounts and understanding facts. But that is not knowing. But once you see this message, nothing else compares to it. There's nothing else that will touch it. There's nothing else. Amen. Once you see this message, could you ever go back to your former understanding? I'll tell you what. I, I, the, by the grace of God, he opened our eyes 20-some years ago to the message of the hour. I was raised all my life in a Pentecostal church, amen, and I can say without a shadow of a doubt, I would never, never want to go back to where I was, to that Pentecostal church, but where I was was the best I knew at the time, but I would never want to go back. But I'll tell you this, God has continued to unfold himself. I don't want to go back one year. I don't want to go back to my previous understanding a year ago, amen? I don't want to go back to what I was five years ago, amen? Once you see the message and keep seeing the message, there's no desire to return back even to my own conception two or three years ago. I say, God, I want to see more, amen? I want to keep moving deeper and further and higher in you. I, I, there's no going back. So we can say, there's, you know, there's no going back to a previous age. That's absolutely true. But for me, I don't want to go back to a previous understanding. Even if we say in the message, when I was serving God with all my heart, when I was believing the message with all that was in me to believe it, and I saw all that I could see, I still don't want to go back to that. I want to keep moving forward. He said, now, everything else is gone. The rest of it's just filler. See, when you once see the message, that was in Noah's time. 
When Noah and his group, when they saw the message, nothing else mattered. When Moses' group saw it, nothing else mattered. When John's group saw it, nothing else mattered. When Jesus' group saw it, nothing else mattered. When the apostles' group saw it, nothing else mattered. When Luther's group saw it, Wesley's group saw it, Pentecostal group saw it, nothing else mattered. They pulled away from everything. Amen. Can you say that once you saw this message, nothing else mattered? Amen. It wasn't... uh, I could say, express it from my own personal uh, uh, experience. Nobody took anything from me when I saw the message. Nobody took from us entertainment, our TV, the clothes we wore. Nobody took from us our revelation or understanding. Nobody took anything from me. I dropped everything to grab a hold of this. That's why if somebody feels like they've given up something for the message, then my my question is, what revelation do you have of the message? Because if you have to give up something to come to the message, then you don't really understand what the message is because the message is Christ, and there's only gain. There's no loss. So if we have to feel like we've given up or forsaken or, or, or lost something to come to the message, then maybe we don't have a clear understanding yet of what the message is. Maybe to us, it's just maybe a better form of understanding. And to be in the better or correct form of understanding, I've got to, uh, I've got to adhere to certain standards and certain things that the prophet taught. So in adherence to a better or more perfect understanding, I'm willing to give up this. That's the wrong revelation. That is the absolute wrong revelation. And I think that's why sometimes people find themselves so frustrated. I've talked to people who've been frustrated in the message and frustrated about rules and frustrated about standards and frustrated. And I'm wondering why they're frustrating because I I cannot relate because it's not frustrating for me. And I didn't, that's, that's not a, a statement of arrogance or pride. It's an actual inability to relate. So I've wondered and questioned why. Why is it frustrating? Why do you feel so cheated? Why do you feel so robbed? Why do you feel like you've missed out on something? Because for me, I feel like Paul said, I gave it up and to me it was dung. It was all but dung. I realized it was worthless. It wasn't helping me. It didn't do anything for me. Amen. But this message is my life. Amen. It's my origin. It expresses to me where I originated from, where I'm going to. Amen. There was zero loss. Amen. When, when the prophet of God started saying something about, you know, conduct or dress or, or television or entertainment, for me, I was like, something inside said, that's right. Now, my flesh, my flesh did not enjoy cutting off the TV, but my soul was liberated. Amen. Your flesh may not enjoy putting down the cigarettes, giving up the alcohol, or dropping the entertainment, but if you really catch this message, your soul will fly. Say, this is what I've wanted all my life. Amen. Praise be to God. God is so good to us, friends. Once you see this message, Brother Bram says, there's nothing else that you can see but that. Amen. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25. He says, At this time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, has revealed them unto, un, them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Let's go over to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 9. Luke 8 and 9. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. 
But to others in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. So Jesus is saying, Father, I thank you that you hid this from the eyes of the wise and the prudent and revealed them unto babes. What babes? Babes of the kingdom, children of God. And he tells the disciples, I'm speaking in parables because they're not to see. The mysteries are only for you. So don't forget our title. Our title this morning is, uh, the, uh, I don't even remember what title is. Let me look. The Mystery in Plain Sight. The mystery in plain sight. Remember when Brother Brandon preached God hiding, uh, uh, hidden and revealed in simplicity, hiding himself in simplicity, revealing himself the same. He also hides himself in plain sight, but only reveals it to the babes. So everybody has the Bible. Everybody who wants the Bible has the Bible. Anybody who wants to can read about the seals, amen? You can read uh, in, in Revelation chapter 6. Amen. But God must unlock the understanding. God must give us eyes to see. So he has to put it in plain sight, but he must hide it. Because that's what he chose to do. He chose to make it available. Amen. And make it completely unavailable. It's available. Anybody can pick up this Bible and read, and anybody can find the message. You can find it on the internet. You can find it from a friend. You can get books for free, tapes for free, go on several different places online and listen to it for free or read it for free. Anybody can find this message and read it. Anybody can have a Bible who wants to have a Bible, at least anybody in America. And so you see that God made it available, amen, but he made it available, but yet it's hidden because it takes a key to unlock what you're looking at because what you're looking at is in mystery form, amen, but yet he's been expressing this great mystery all the way through the Bible. So the Bible is an expression of God's one great goal. But nobody knows what that great goal is unless God has un given you a key in your heart of faith and that faith will now unlock the program of God and you go back and look at your Bible and say, it's a new book. He says in the, in the message, spiritual food in due season, we find out that when a man comes sent from God, ordained of God with the truth, thus saith the Lord, the message and the messenger are one and the same. Because he is sent to represent, thus saith the Lord, word by word. So he and his message is the same. Amen. Amen. A denominational man under denominational auspices, he and the church is one. A theologian under theology made by some denomination, he and his message are one. Church of theology, a theologian, it's correctly. Then when a man comes with thus saith the Lord, he and the message is one. And when Elijah come with thus saith the Lord, he and his message become one, just as Jesus, when he come, he was the word, St. John 1. So the word of God and the messenger of the age was the self-same thing all the time. That's right. This is good. Jesus was the word that was prophesied of. He was what the prophet said would happen. A virgin shall conceive and bear his child. Way back in the beginning, God told him, said, a woman's seed shall bruise the serpent's head and he'll and he'll bruise her heel. All these prophecies had been given. David crying all the rest of the prophets down through the ages, speaking of him. He was the word manifested, hallelujah. Now do you see where I'm trying to get to? I spoke with you pretty plain this morning. Don't you see the authority of the living God and the living church, the bride? Now he's talking about the authority of the living God and the living church, the bride. The sick are healed. The dead are raised, the cripples walk, the blind see, the gospel goes forth and its power for the message and the messenger are the same. The word is in the church and the person. Now the word, the messenger and his message become the same. So Brother Frank, if you could help me turn on this, uh, the, the whiteboard. He says in the Feast of Trumpets, he said, look, I wanna say one more thing closely now. Don't miss how striking from the seventh angel's message, Brother Bram is talking about something else, but he's injecting a statement I want to glean out of this. He said, from the seventh angel's message uh, to Revelations 10 was the seventh seal to the seventh trumpet between those times. So he's trying to tell you that between the, the, the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, Revelations 10 is inserted in there. So he's trying to tell you that, but he injects a thought that I want to catch. He says, don't miss it, how striking. From the seventh angel's message... 
messenger of the seventh seal. So Brother Branham, the seventh angel is the messenger of the seventh seal. And in the messenger and his message become the same thing. You catch that? He's the messenger of the seventh seal, and the messenger and his message become the same thing. So he becomes a manifestation of the seventh seal, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. The coming of the Son of Man. Amen. A Son of Man revealing the Son of Man. He becomes... His life becomes the word for that age. His ministry becomes the ministry. He's the messenger of the seventh seal. His life becomes a display of the seventh seal. The Son of Man ministry has returned. He says, now, uh, in the questions and answers, he says, now, in that day the prophet was the word, for he was the manifestation of the word to the world. He was the manifestation of the word to the world. Amen. And then he says, uh, who do you say this is? He said, here's a woman standing here. I'm a young man waiting to get married. She meets me specifically in every way. She's a lovely Christian. She looks like one. She dresses like one. She acts like one. She lives like one. I'll admit she'd make me a good wife, but she isn't mine till I take her for mine. That's the way the message is. You can sympathize with it and say it's right but you've got to take it yourself to become part of it. Then you and the message becomes one. Then the anointing's with you as it, as it is with others. Amen. So we're going to uh, uh, write something here. So when in the first coming... In the first coming... You have a forerunner. So that's John the Baptist. And that forerunner was a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make, path, uh, make his path straight. He was preparing the people through repentance, amen, for the coming of the Lord. And so now, and he had the forerunner ministry. He and his message became the same thing because he was the forerunner, and he was the he was the message of forerunner. He was showing forerunning, and he was ministering repentance and preparing for forerunning. But then, the thing that he foreran came on the scene, and that was Jesus Christ. So you had one, two vessels. Amen. When Brother Eugene Brown was here a couple years ago, he, he first went through this with us, and that's the first time I, I saw this. He did a little diagram up here, if you remember. But when we come over here to the second coming, the coming of the Son of Man, you had a forerunner, which was Elijah, but the thing he foreran came in him. Son of Man ministry. So this caused some confusion because we're expecting this to be the same way. And God always does the same thing, but not necessarily the same way. So he brought a forerunner, an Elijah again, and and when he brought the forerunner, he brought the forerunner in one vessel Then he brought, amen, uh, uh, Christ in another vessel. And so now the forerunner and Christ come together in the water. And now the ministry moves to the Son of Man from the forerunner. And and John now has to pass off of the scene. Is that right? So now when we come to the end of time, we're looking for the coming of the Son of Man, the Son of Man ministry to return on the earth. 
Amen. And we notice that there's an Elijah forerunner that has to come from Malachi 4. And we see the forerunner coming. So the forerunner comes. Amen. And then, and then we have the opening of the seals. We, we have the, the fullness of the word returning back into the church. And then we have the forerunner, amen, beginning to say something like, now, now, I, if he's here, I have to go off the scene. Two of us can't be here at the same time. And so now we automatically start looking for another vessel. Because we're looking for a replication of the same thing, but it's the same thing, but not the same way. Now, the very thing that, that, that the ministry was forerunning, amen, he was here, amen, as a forerunner to turn the hearts back. He was here for the opening of the seals and the opening of the seventh seal, but, but he becomes a display of the seventh seal. The very life of Jesus Christ, the very life that Jesus Christ lived on earth in Galilee, he was living through that man. He would say, I mean, Brother Ben would stay on the platform. He said, you didn't touch me. I'm just a man. I'm 20 feet from you. Who did you touch? You touched the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ was there. Amen. He was present. He was ministering the same way that he ministered 2,000 years ago. So it was a son of man revealing the son of man. So now, uh, the, you can get, can, we can get confused if we look at and looking for a replica. Now there's a forerunner, and Brother Branham tells us very clearly that he must come, amen, while the forerunner's on earth. Is that true? So like before, he must come when the forerunner's on earth. And he said, he said the seventh angel will be on earth at the time of this coming, Revelation 10. So now when we look at the previous, okay, we say, well, where did he go? I mean, where's he at? He, he's supposed to come. Now Brother Branham passes off the scene. And now Brother Branham, when, when God takes that vessel off of the scene, now we're, 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 we're finding a, a question in people's hearts, or there was in the past. I thought, amen, he had to be on earth at the time of this coming. Maybe Brother Branham made a mistake in the breach. Maybe he cleared it up later. I don't understand what he's talking about because I didn't see a replica of what I saw. 2,000 years ago, but I'd say you saw the same thing, amen? You just didn't see it the same way. And that's what causes confusion. And he says, now, I must decrease and he must increase, amen? And, and when John said that, he could look to a physical person and he could say, now, this person, his ministry's decreasing, mine's, uh, mine's decreasing, I'll go off the scene, he continues on, amen? But now, when we come to the end time, the end time prophet, amen, the prophet becomes the word for that age and his message and the messenger become the same thing. So now he's talking about the coming of the Son of Man, the coming of the Word, amen, the coming of the mighty angel, amen, and Revelations 10 takes place, and everything Brother Branham said in the breach is true. So he comes. But Brother Branham, uh, this ministry this time is a bride coming. Because the bridegroom already came. The bridegroom was already expressed. This coming was a bride coming of Christ. And so it, set, it could set in so much confusion unless we let the prophet be right. And if we allow the prophet to be correct in what he says, then all of a sudden you say, amen, brother, that's right. Because now when Christ is coming, the Son of Man is coming, he's coming in that form because Brother Branham is part of the bride also. He's a forerunner, but he's also a bride member. Brother Branham, Brother Branham was there to bridge a gap to take us from the denominational ages into the bride age. So he himself was coming out of the denominational ages into the bride age. He himself was bride. He himself was resurrected out of dead denominationalism. He himself, amen, was brought up by the revealing of the word. He himself was part of the bride, amen. So the very ministry that he had, the message he brought, amen, he and the message became the same thing. So when you wanted to see the bride coming of Christ, you look at the forerunner who had received the fullness of the revelation, and he was a member of the bride also. Amen. Let me keep going. He says, 
Very familiar in the rising of the sun. Christ was the first one to raise from all the prophets and so forth. Although typed in many places, he was the first fruits of those that slept. In the bride coming of Christ, coming out of the church, there'll have to be a sheaf waved again in the last days. Oh, waving of a sheaf. What is the sheaf? The first one that come to mature, the first one that proved it was a wheat, that proved it was a sheaf. Hallelujah, I'm sure you see what I'm talking about. It was waved over the people and the first time there will come forth for the bride age, for a resurrection out of dark denominationalism, will be a message that the full maturity of the word is turned back again in full power and being waved over the people by the same signs and wonders that he did back there. Amen, my question is, did that happen? Amen. The first thing that comes forth, here's what he said, the first time there will come forth for the bride age, for resurrection out of dark denominationalism will be a message, amen? The message, uh, the message that he is here will be a message that the full maturity of the word is turned back again in its full power and being waved over the people by the same sign and wonders. So now that message and that messenger become the same thing. Now he's an expression of his message. And his message is being caught, called out of dead denomination and brought into a bride age. The message is the bride coming of Christ, and now he becomes a reflection of that message. Praise be to God. Amen. That's important. All right. Let's keep going here. So now I want to go back to this previous quote that I just read. And who do you say this is from 1964? Now he says, he's talking about a woman that's there, and he's saying that she could make a good wife. We just read this. She meets every qualification, every way. She's lovely Christian. She looks like one. She dresses like one, acts like one. She lives like one. I'll admit she'd make me a good wife, but she isn't mine till I take her for mine. That's the way the message is. You can sympathize with it and say it's right, but you've got to take it yourself to become part of it, then you and the message become one. So now you and the message, Brother Branham and his message became one, but now we and the message have to become one. And we can't get this by sympathizing with the message or acknowledging that it's right or probably the better way to live. But no, we must take the message, which is Christ for our day, and take it into ourselves. Get in it. Get under it. Get in it. Get it in us. However, fully surrender, fully submit, fully give ourselves to this word and embrace it with everything that's in us. And then you and the message become one. What is the message? It's the opening of the seals. It's the opening of the seventh seal. It's a return of the fullness of the word and life of Christ. It is the bride coming of Christ. That's the message. And when you take that message into yourself, you and the message become one. So you become the bride coming of Christ. <laughs> it's not something we talk about. See, the, Brother Ben told us the message isn't something we come together to talk about. It's something we get into. We get under, this isn't teaching, this isn't doctrine. You know, we have doctrine because doctrine is teaching. That's, that's, that's right, we want doctrine. There's nothing wrong with doctrine. I love doctrine. Doctrine is our teaching on the word. We have doctrine, amen? We, we, we even have a, a, an understanding of what's pleasing to God in the way we fashion ourselves and the way we conduct ourselves. So we have order, we have structure, we have church order. We have all of that in the message, but all of that is not the message. We, it's included because you can't have the word without having doctrine. You can't have the word without having order. You can't have the word without having somebody that obey the word and submit to it. All of that is part of it. But if we have obedience and doctrine and understanding and all of these things, that's still not the same as having the message, amen, because the message is a person, amen. The message is the person of Jesus Christ, and it's time for him to manifest on this earth in a many-membered bride. That is the message of the hour, the bride coming of Christ. It is not something we talk about. It's something we are. You can't talk about the message and be in the message. The message must be in you, and you and the message must become the same thing. That's the message. So the message is not comparing dates and times. Brother Branham lived this time, and he preached these, ser these series of messages. He did these miracles. That's, that's yet not what God wants in this hour. 
God wants a people and himself, the word, to become the self-same thing. So that we become the message. So you can say, what is the message? And you can say, by the grace of God, I am the message. Remember Brother Bram told us that all the time when somebody went looking for the Welsh Revival. Where is the Welsh Revival? And they were looking for the location of the Welsh Revival. And then, you know, they went to a, a policeman and he said, I am the Welsh Revival. Brother Bram said, you've arrived. <laughs> You're here because the revival's in me. Where do I find the message? The message is a people on this earth that have the very life of Jesus Christ. The mind of God has been opened to them. The mystery has been taken off of the word. It's implanted into the hearts of the people and now they're becoming one with it and the thing that they're seeing, they're starting to reflect. They're starting to live the very thing that they're looking at, amen? And that is the message, friends. That's why if we, if we stop with some correct teaching and a good church structure, amen, and get everybody looking right and dressing right, and we stop and we set up camp there, I'm telling you we're gonna very, very quickly find ourselves outside the message. We may not even be contradicting what Brother Branham taught or contradicting his order or saying that he's wrong, amen, but, but not moving in with the life of Christ as Christ is revealing himself and we're not moving and ebbing and flowing with the revelation of the hour. We're gonna find ourselves stuck back here in an order, a structure, a form, amen, and not moving with Christ as he wants to display himself in this end time. Amen. That's why I don't want to go back to a former understanding. Because as God reveals himself more, amen, I find within me a greater love and a greater desire for him, a greater obedience and a greater surrender. Amen. And it didn't come from a stronger willpower. Amen. It come from a greater revelation. So as he unfolded himself to me, I find in me, amen, uh, just a natural surrender as he reveals himself to me. So, so we don't want, oh, I say we don't want structure. We do want structure. We do want order. We do want form. We want the doctrine. We want, we want the standards. We want all of it. But what God really wanted was to live in a people and fullness on this earth and express the entire mystery through her. That's really what he wants in this hour. That's why we can give, we can give fervent obedience and still have missed the mind of God. We can give fervent effort to be in church every time the doors are open, pray and read my Bible every day, but we could still miss the whole purpose and whole plan of God. But being fervent in, in our religious efforts. So that's not what we want. We want, you, you've got to, what Brother Bram is saying, you've got to take it yourself to become part of it. Then you and the message become one. Then, this is the part that's exciting, then the anointing's with you as it is with others. See, you, you, we've heard so many people say sometimes, I believe the message, I just can't live it. You ever heard that? Well, I agree with you 1,000%. I believe the message and I can't live it. <laughs> so I quit trying to live it and I just embraced it, amen? And when I embraced it and received it, he lived it through me, amen? It wasn't anymore me living it. Now, that doesn't mean we never have a choice to make. We never have a decision to make. We never sacrifice. That, that's not, I'm not saying we still have our own choices to make. But really, my choices, my feeble effort to make choices would never get me to the destination. I would always find myself frustrated trying to live the message, saying I believe the message, but I can't live the message. Well, really, you believe about the message, but you not yet met the person of the message. Because if you meet the person of the message and embrace that person, that person will enter into you and live the message out of you. That's what Brother Ben is saying. You become, you take it to yourself to become part of it, then you and the message become one. Then the anointing's with you as it is with the others because you can't do anything without an anointing. And if you're trying to use your own human mind and effort, you're gonna find yourself failed, 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 failed. 
frustrated, ready to quit, ready to give up, knowing that the message is true, but I must be serpent seed. I would never in a million years confess such a thing. No matter whatever passes through your mind, never let a statement like that come out of your mouth. But you say, I believe by the grace of God I'm one of his, and I just want to throw my whole self into this word. I want to receive it with everything that's in me. Amen. And we got to stop reading the message looking for rules and start reading the message looking for him. Because... Uh, the message can be used falsely as a safety net. And it's a wrong concept. That because I know the message is true, and if I do all I can to do what Brother Branham said, I'll be okay. And so we're, we're not, and that's where this frustration trying to live the message and and. Always living in compromise, always trying to find out where the gray area is and what's okay and what's not okay. I mean, sometimes you talk to people and they're always trying to get something to fit. Some habit, some lifestyle, something they enjoy doing, whatever it is. You find, you find somebody's always trying to find justification in the message for it. No, I said, well, Brother Branham said this, and Brother Branham said that, and I want my justification. Listen, I think we should always study the message, and we should always find the mind of Christ through the word of God and through the message of the hour. And when Brother Branham explains something, we should take, pay, pay heed to that and let that influence our lives. But you can come to that with the wrong concept and try to use the message as a safety net to say, if I can find an allowance in the quotes... If I can find a place where I can still do this, have this, amen, enjoy this, and still be in the message, then I am in the safety net of the message and I'll be okay. And listen, that is zero personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is nothing more than using the message as a form of religion to find a pass to heaven. And it's the wrong concept. Now, listen, the truth is a razor's edge because I believe that God shared his mind through that prophet. And what he said is subject to be lived by. So don't get me wrong. I'm not rejecting anything that he said. I'm telling you, you can accept what he said and use it the wrong way for the wrong kind of justification and still not be seeking the person of the word. I want to ask you, what did God want? Did God want a correct church that had all the doctrine right and could all sit in nice little rows and look right? Or did he want a wife, someone to know him, to love him, to have communion with him? So we can't use the message as a structure to find acceptance with God. We use the message to find God. (laughs) It's the word expressing himself to us. It's a love letter to us for that we would know him. We're not here to find a structure. We're here to find the person and to embrace the person and become one with the person. And then you and the message become one. Then the anointing's with you as it was with others. Amen. Let's keep going. And God's power to transform. That word has come to pass. It's God's word. Plant it in your heart. If you want to go in a rapture, if you want to be a Christian, genuine, place this word. As I believe it was Ezekiel, God said, take the scroll and eat it up. And the prophet and the word would become the same. And every promise in there has to manifest itself because it's God's original seed. So Brother Ben is telling us, he's going back to Ezekiel where he was told to take the scroll and, and eat the scroll. And he's saying, he's told, that's the word and symbolized the word, eat the word to become one with the word so that you and the word become the same thing. So you see, Ezekiel wasn't told to read the scroll. He was told to eat the scroll. I'd say it this way. I, I, I gotta be careful how I say this. I'm not encouraging you to read the message. I want you to eat the message. (laughs) I'm not encouraging you to read your Bible. I want you to feed on your Bible, amen? 
I want you to take it inside. Amen. Take it. I mean, let's take our, the word of God and take it inside to us and become one with it and embrace it and love it and give everything to it and receive it in its fullness. We gotta, I, I want to stop. Oh, if somebody would take one little clip of what I said, I'm going to be in a big trouble. No longer do I want to read the message. I want to feed on Christ. I want to eat the book. I want to become one with it. I want to get all of my nutrients, all of my vitamins, everything I need for spiritual survival. I want to become the contents of that book. I want the contents of the book to be in me, and I want to live. I want it to live outside, out of me. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Revelation chapter 10 and read this in our day. I, I changed something in a prayer of mine a couple years ago as God was opening the word so much to me. I said, I'd been in the message for many years and loved the word, loved everything about it, loved every tape I listened to, every book I read, loved my Bible, loved the church, loved everything. But as God was quickly beginning to open the word to me, I, I started seeing, uh, it was just a love affair. There was such joy in my heart. Amen. And and that's why Brother Branham said that the wine that they, that they get drunk on is the stimulation of revelation. It is exciting. It is thrilling when Christ opens himself to us. And I begin to enjoy that so much, amen, that communion with the Lord as he revealed himself to me and, 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 and as I was becoming one with him. And I stopped reading my Bible to understand something. And I started reading my Bible to understand someone. And when I would pick up my Bible, I said, Lord, would you reveal yourself to me in this Bible? And that was a simple prayer, but it was profound for me because my attitude was changing. I wasn't reading any more to have the correct information. And that's how I used to read the Bible, not because I was bad, I wanted the correct information. And you read the Bible, you'll get the correct information. There's nothing wrong with that. But my main motivation was to get the correct information so that I would know the truth. But God gave us his word not so that we would sit in the millennium over against the tree and, and hold our Bible and read this word, but so that we would become one with him and know him and have a relationship with him and become his bride in the millennium. So I love my Bible because my Bible is expressing him. And I'm reading my Bible to understand him. I'm reading my Bible to come into a greater unity with him. But it's all about a unity with him. That's why you have some people, uh, uh, we can be guilty of this both ways. We can become so intellectual we miss the personal relationship and just get the information. And we can become so spiritual we just want a, re re uh, a relationship but no information. So we have, we, what we have then under that, when we re leave the word out of our relationship, no message, no revelation, no Bible, we just say, I just love him, I just wanna know him, uh, I don't need to know all that information, I just want him. Well, you gotta be careful because if you leave out the revelation of the word and just try to embrace him, that you're gonna find that you have a crush on somebody that you're not even in a relationship with. You're infatuated with somebody, amen, that you're not even in a relationship with because he is the person of the word. You cannot leave out the word and have the person. So we must bring this together, amen, where we get the revelation of the word because that revelation is unveiling him and then we embrace the one who's been unveiled to us. And it becomes a relationship, a oneness, a unity. And then we take the word into ourselves and become the manifestation of the message. Revelations 10, 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, 
thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now we know John here in the vision, he's told to go and take the book, and that book was the open book, amen, where the seals had been opened that the mighty angel had brought down, and he goes and he takes the book, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of the mind of God, the book of redemption, the open Bible, all of those things, and he's told to take it and eat it up, amen, and he's told, once again, the instruction was not to read it, but to eat it. I said, God, help us to feast on this word. But then they're supposed to prophesy again. So then after they eat it, there's still a message that goes out. And when you eat it, amen, now your message and the messenger become the same. Because now what are we prophesying again? What does the bride, when she eats this book, prophesy again? She prophesies the contents of the book. Not anything new, what she's received, but now what she received is in her. She's sharing who she is. She's sharing what's going on inside of her. She's sharing the message, but she is the message sharing the message. Just like Brother Branham was the message sharing the message. Amen. Praise God. Brother Branham said in the Christ is the mystery God revealed, he said, that's it. Christ, the word, he was the word, he is the word, and the church becomes the word by him making her part of him, and that's the word again. Amen. And again, in Christ is the mystery God revealed. It says he is expressing himself. That's his purpose. That's why he died. That's the second fold of his threefold manifestation. First, to express himself in Christ, then express himself through the church. And the same thing, Christ was the word and the church becomes the word when it lets the word go through them. It's a surrender to the word. It's a submission to the word. The, the church becomes the word when it lets the word go through them. I wanna turn to Luke. Let's turn to Luke chapter one. And let's start at verse 34. Luke chapter 1 and verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, shall, she, also, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now, Mary became the word by letting the word flow through her. Is that right? Mary was predestinated before the foundation of the world to be the vessel that God would bring the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of virgin shall conceive. She was predestinated to be that fulfillment, but she had to receive the message. And so one day she was walking along and an angel of the Lord came to bring her the message. And that message was not information. That message was her place in the, in the plan of God. So when that angel brought the message to Mary, the angel was positioning Mary in the redemption plan, the redemptive plan of God. And I like to say this, the messenger that came in this day did not come to bring us information about somebody else and something else and somewhere else. He came to position you, the virgin bride of Jesus Christ, in the plan of redemption. And so now this angel comes to her, amen, not to tell her, hey, across town, guess what? A virgin's gonna conceive. It's time for the promised fulfillment. The message came to her to tell her, you're the location. You're the location of the fulfillment of the prophecy for this hour. It'll be in you. You're the chosen one. You're highly favored. God has chosen you. And now from you is going to come the word. So she is part of the word. Within her is the word because she was in the thought of God before the foundation of the world. But now she has to come in contact with the message and the message is to unlock her. And she has questions, of course, 
Natural questions. How will this be? I know not a man. And, and, and the angel said, the Holy Ghost will overshadow you, the thing that's formed in you. Amen. And she says, be it unto me according to your word. Not, uh, not, could I have a textbook on this? Could I have time to think about it? Uh, what actions do I need to take? What should I do? Should I just, amen, be it unto me according to your word. I will be that vessel. I believe the message. I believe what you're telling me. Listen, you, you have to understand if we could just put ourselves back into a 15 or 16-year-old girl's body in Nazareth who's nobody from nowhere, amen, and she's engaged to a man to be married who, who's a bit of an older man, amen, and she's got all this going on in her life, and she's just going to the well to fetch water like she always does, and here comes a messenger from God to tell her that this is the time and the hour and the season for the manifestation of the world. The coming of the Lord is now, and it's going to start in you. And she goes, how? And he gives an explanation that doesn't explain. And she says, be it unto me, according to your word. This is such a simple statement, be it unto me according to your word. But it's not simple, friends. By saying that, she's acknowledging that I believe you, that I was in the back part of God's mind when he was having Isaiah give a prophecy, he was thinking of me. That be it unto me was loaded with meaning, friends. She was receiving the revelation of her hour, and she was receiving the revelation of herself in that hour. She was receiving the revelation of her position in God in that hour. And when she said, be it unto me, she was saying, I believe what you tell me, that I believe that I'm the virgin that Isaiah spoke of, that God thought of before the foundation of the world, when there was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world, that you were going to bring it through a virgin because you knew there was going to be a fall. You see, this be it unto me is loaded with meaning. She had to accept it. She had to receive it. And then she let, she let that word flow through her. She could not produce it. She could not manufacture it. She could not copy it. What could she do? There was nothing she could do. Well, what have we heard in this hour? There's been a messenger. There's been a seventh angel messenger that come and give us a, a revelation of the word to be performed in this hour, but that messenger was unlocking the mystery in us and placing us in that mystery, placing us as the vessels the word would come through. Amen. And, and you can, we can look at this and you can see the wave sheaf and say, there's no way I can do that. I can tell you, God's not asking you to do that. God's not asking you to do anything, amen? That's what sometimes becomes so discouraging, people. They, they look at Brother Branham's life, and they look at the maturity he came to, and the character he had, and the manifestation. Say, I can never do that. I, well, I would venture to say, he never did that. That's what he told us. He said, I'm not the one who does this. I'm not the one who did this. I was only standing by when he did those things. He wasn't looking for somebody who could perform to the task. Mary never could perform to the task. He's looking for somebody who will say, I believe that's the truth, and I yield myself to that truth, and be it unto me according to your words. Now, can we listen to the prophet and can calling out a bride? And listen, we can look at the prophet calling out a bride as a story. We can look at it as a mark in time that he's calling on a bride, but we need to take the message personally. He's calling me bride. That messenger come to me and he's saying, you're the bride, you're the place of the fulfillment of the word. It's time for the bride coming of Christ and he wants to come inside of you. And you can say, but I can never, but I this, and I've got this habit, and I'm this. And Mary could do the same thing. Mary can say, but I'm from a poor family. I'm from out of the way. I'm already engaged to a man. I, I've got this circumstance. I've got that circumstance. Nobody will believe me. Listen, at that point, none of that matters because there's a prophecy, amen, there's a, something in the mind of God that'll trump every circumstance and bring the past the word of God. So now none of her circumstances mattered anymore. All that mattered was what the angel told her was the truth. And when she received it and yielded herself to it, then the Holy Ghost came and brought to pass everything that was in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. 
So when we look at the life of Brother Bram and say, I can never, I can never, I'm telling you that you can be whatever God has already designed for you to be. What he's looking for is not effort. He's looking for a surrender. He's looking for somebody who will let the word flow through them. And say, God, I give myself to this word. I give my mind. I give my life. I give my body. I give everything. Just let it flow through me. Praise be to God. I'm wanting to get to something. We may have to finish it up on Wednesday, but I got something in my heart. We'll touch on it today, Lord willing. Let's turn, let's turn to Luke 24 together. Luke 24 and verse 25. It says, after the resurrection, this is the road to Emmaus. When I read in Christ the mystery of God revealed, what I stopped reading there, which is the first, just the first couple pages, right at the beginning of Brother Benham's ministry, at, after his greetings and after all of that, he goes into uh, prayer, he reads the scriptures, then we read what we read, and immediately after we read what he read, he goes into the road to Emmaus story. Jesus stepping out from the bushes and talking to the disciples, asking them why they're so grieved as they walk along the way. So Brother Branham in Christ, the mystery of God, he's telling us that there's one mystery, the whole, the whole Bible's been expressing one mystery, and every type's been expressing it, and here today I'm hoping you'll see it, and then he goes right into the road to Emmaus story. So I just want to grab a couple verses out of this. Let's look at verse 24. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher. They're explaining to Jesus what had been happening. Went to the sepulcher and found even as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So here in the resurrection, they're confused about what's happening. They're discouraged because Christ has died. They're walking down to Emmaus, and he steps out of the bushes, and he begins to, to, to ask them questions, and they begin to express their trouble. And he calls them fools and slow of heart to understand. And he, and he says, he starts to go through the scriptures, and he goes down. Brother Bam said they had a six-hour Bible study on fulfilled prophecy. For the journey, he begins to go down through the scriptures and he begins to pull out of the scriptures, amen, the scriptures concerning himself, amen. What was he doing? He was showing the mystery in plain sight. He goes to Moses and no doubt to Noah and to David and he, and he goes to the Psalms and Brother Bram starts talking about some of the scriptures he no doubt went to and began to explain and, and he begins to pull out of the scriptures and starts to show to them that there's been a mystery in this death. There's been a mystery, amen, in this coming, amen, and the mystery has been laying in plain sight, amen, but now, amen, I'm going to unveil to you the mystery so that you can look back in your Bible and you can see it was there, it was there, it was was there it was there and we know that this happens because Peter and Paul and John and James they from then on amen after Pentecost they're able to go back and say this is what the prophecy said and this is what the prophet said over here because when he unveiled the mystery, amen, he shows that this has all been in the Bible. Amen, all you had to go back is look at what's in plain sight. It's been laying there for everyone to read. But until he unlocks the, by revelation the mystery to you, you can't see what you're reading. And here's what Brother Bram says in Christ's mystery of God revealed. He says, now, if you want to mark this down, i got so many places I want to read from. And in the book of St. Luke, the 24th chapter of St. Luke, we find it's the, it's the two apostles on the road to Emmaus and Jesus stepping out after his resurrection and they were on their road over to Emmaus going along the road thinking and talking and weeping on account of his death and how they seen him suffer to what they had thought was of no value at all. They took their Lord and crucified him and they were going along there weeping and he stepped out from the roadside and began to talk to them about Christ. He said, oh fools and slow to understand don't you know that all the prophets in the psalm, see, what was he doing? Identifying himself to those apostles. That all of the prophets and all of the psalms and everything was him expressed. So now, 
they get a six-hour Bible study on fulfilled prophecy. Back to Christ as the mystery of God revealed, the prophet says, now, notice now, down through the ages, he has been gradually letting this out, slowly unfolding the mystery through the prophets and through the types. Now we can just go on to that and, ex and expressing himself. Amen. Now, in the message, I, the identified masterpiece of God, it says, now we notice that God began to make a bride for Christ. And the bride must be identified with him and in him because it is part of him. And the bride is part of him. She is part of him. The word for that day, the bride becomes part of that word for it's Christ. Now you believe that? We have to be in Christ. In Christ, we have to be of Christ. In Christ, part of Christ. So I want to go back and just, just share something that I've been looking at. Amen. And this morning, things were coming so fast, I just got a piece of paper and started jotting it down. So I'm just going to have to write some things out. So let me see here. All right. I'm going to go back to this drawing that I've been drawing in this timeline. So I'm not a good artist, so when I get stuck on something, I just kind of stick with it. So you have to forgive me. But we, on this timeline... We were drawing this, this timeline of redemption, and we talked about what was in the mind of God and how it come down into time and been expressed all the way through. It was in fullness here, and then it began to express it in bride form over here, all the way till we get to the fullness again. All right, but it's fullness in bride form. So here we have it. Bridegroom form, and here we have it in bride form. Because he first formed Adam, and then he took out of Adam what he needed to make the woman. And so I want to go back, and I'm just reminding you of that image there. I want to go back and just draw, if I can. I just want to look at the Old Testament for a minute. So I'm just going to come down here and draw the Old Testament part of this. Now, when Jesus was on the uh, road to Emmaus with those two disciples, he was there in his resurrection. And, and in the resurrection ministry, we know that he begins to reveal the mystery of what had just happened to them. So you see, part of Jesus' resurrection ministry is to go back to the scriptures and reveal their day, modern events made clear by prophecy. So that's part of the resurrection ministry. And so... Now, today, well, Brother Ben, on the road to Emmaus, or he talks about the road to Emmaus, how he begins to go into the life of David and how he's a rejected king, and to the Psalms where he was crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And to the Psalms where they said they parted my garments, and he starts to show it's all been fulfilled. Amen, it was laying in a mystery, you missed it, but with the key of faith and with revelation, we can look back and see it there, 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 and there. But now we've come to the end time where God has unlocked another layer of the mystery because in that day, he unlocked the mystery of Jesus Christ, amen, God, amen, in the form of flesh as his son coming to pay the price of redemption. And he shows that all the Old Testament was speaking of that all the way till there, amen. But then when Brother Branham comes and starts showing us that the bride was always in him, the bride was a part of that mystery. Amen. When Adam came forth, he was a revelation of the thought of God. Is that When Adam was made and formed on the earth, he was a revelation of the thought of God. But there was a further revelation of the thought of God that was with him. And then it was expressed out, amen, and it was expressed out into a form and united back together with him. It was a further expression of the mind of God, and it was a further expression of what was with Adam all along. And so, I want to go back, and let's look back at the Old Testament. I just want to grab a few stories here, and I want to show that this bride, this manifestation of the female has been all through the Bible. So if Christ has been there, we know that Christ is going to be expressed male and female. So there's no time that we're not going to go into this in depth. I'm just going to take a few points, and I'm going to show here that we have here an expression of Adam, right? 
But there wasn't just an expression of Adam. We know that there was also, with Adam, an expression of wife. And she was Mrs. Adam. So even from the very beginning, when God is going to start showing a son of God, amen, and this son of God will fall, showing that we need to have another son of God that won't fall, but even in that expression, there's a female expression that goes with it. So when you see the male, the female's there. Now, we're going to start to see this pattern all through the Bible because we come down here to the end time. When we come to the revelation of the message, Brother Branham starts to express some things that, that, that the, the church has lost. They've lost the fact that Christ is going to have a bride. The denominations had lost. It's, it was all about Christ. And it was all about Jesus Christ, and he paid the price in the Lamb of God. But they missed scriptures in the New Testament that was talking about the bride, the Lamb's wife, the marriage of the Lamb. There was all of these things that were there. But, but I ask you, which of the denominations are preaching about the bride? Now, I'm not saying none. There might be some who mention it. There might be some who talk about it. But all of my life growing up in churches, nobody was talking about the bride, amen, because it takes somebody to come on the scene in the resurrection ministry and say, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the Bible had written. And he goes, Brother Bam says, this seventh seal was expressed all the way back in the beginning in the book of Genesis. So when, when Brother Branham comes and he starts preaching of a bride age and the invisible union of the bride in Christ and the expression of Christ in bride form, the bride coming of Christ, he's not just talking about something that's happening then. You can look all the way down through the Bible and see that you had this male and female all the way through. I'm just going to take a couple of these. So when you have Adam, then you have the woman. She later gets the name of Eve. But God's plan has to march on. She falls by deception and produces a cane. And so she produces a cane and an Abel. Cain kills Abel and God cuts off Cain. But the plan of God has to continue. So how's the plan of God going to continue from Adam and Eve now will come the next expression God will use, Seth. How was God going to get to Seth without the woman? The woman brought the fall, produced the Cain. Cain killed Abel, but the plan of God has got to continue on. So God, hey, listen, God is foreshadowing all the way back in the Old Testament that he's going to have to use this fallen woman, and this fallen woman is still going to be instrumental in redemption. So even though the woman fell and there's a fallen woman, and this fallen woman is still with a vessel because there's a woman typed with the man, there's still male and female in the expression of Christ. And although the woman has fallen, God is still going to bring through the woman and keep, that, keep the redemption cycle moving forward. So now there comes a Seth, and Seth comes from Eve and Adam. From Seth, he has Enos. Then began men to call upon uh, the name of the Lord. So you can see that God is still moving his program along. Amen. But when the woman uh, dropped uh, uh, out of grace, he didn't cut her off and say, now I'm going to do it without a woman. He can't do it without a woman because all the way at the end time, he's going to be doing it with a woman. So he's got to have the woman intact through the whole Bible. So now, if I could say this without you thinking I'm sacrilegious, but now as we walk down through the road of Emmaus, it's no longer just showing us the bridegroom, the bridegroom, the bridegroom, but now you can go back and say, you see the bride here with the bridegroom? You see the bride here with the bridegroom? Do you see Esther? Amen, what is Esther pointing to? So now, amen, under the, the resurrection ministry of Christ in our day, amen, through a prophetic message, he has brought us back to the understanding that God had this plan from all the way in the beginning, and every type was showing the mystery of Christ. But the mystery of Christ was not male only. The mystery of Christ was going to be expressed male and female, just like the first son. So then we come down here. And now we have another expression in Moses 
Uh, no, before Moses, I'm going to do something else. Oh, I messed my line up. I'm such a nervous artist. Now we come to Abraham. We've been talking about Abraham a lot, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm just going to touch on it. But with Abraham, there's another expression with Abraham. That's Sarah, his wife. Because God says, God says, you're going to have a son, and he's going to come from your own bowels. Right? He said, it's not going to be Eliezer, but you have a son from your own bowels, coming from your own body. And so Sarah and Abraham come up with the plan to take Hagar after God says that, and he produces a son. That son technically come from his own bowels. But yet, that's not the fulfillment of the prophecy. He says, no, in Sarah shall thy, 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 thy Isaac shall come from Sarah, because Sarah is part of Abraham. So when it says she'll come from your own bowels, Abraham and another woman won't work, amen? Because it's got to be Abraham, male and female. And when you get the Abraham, male and female together in God's timing, then you can produce the promised son. So it's not just from Abraham's body. It must come from Abraham and Sarah's body because Sarah's part of Abraham. Are you enjoying the road to Emmaus? Now, we, we can look back and see. Now, in Sarah, Isaac will come from Sarah. Amen. And, and I don't have time to go into all the scriptures, but you can look them up. Sarah now, she comes uh, uh, to the seventh seal. God comes to her privately, and he comes to her in the appointed time, and she receives strength, and she conceives, and now she brings forth the promised son. She's turned young, but after she's turned young, then she has a visitation, amen, from the Lord. The Lord visits Sarah, and she receives strength to conceive. So even when she was turned back young, she still wasn't conceiving. The Lord had to visit her, amen, in a private little room behind closed doors, no public show, meeting with God and Sarah. And when he did, now she was able to bring forth the promised son, and she conceives. But after that, she has a clear vision. And after that, when it's time for them to wean Isaac, and during the party where Isaac being weaned, she sees the son of the bondwoman mocking, and she comes to Abraham, and she says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the bondwoman shall not be heir with my seed. You say, well, that was pretty bold. I mean... The Bible says that we're supposed, the women are supposed to be like Sarah who call Abraham Lord. But boy, she's really telling him what to do. It's because now she has clear understanding. When she produced Hagar, she didn't have clear understanding. Amen. She partially understood the promise. She partially understood the word, and she, with her own effort, tried to make the word come to pass. But now, after her visitation from the Lord, she has a clear understanding, and she says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the child of the bondwoman shall not be heir with my child. He said, wow, that's pretty stiff. Abraham begins to grieve, and God tells Abraham, don't grieve over what Sarah said, but listen to her. She's right. And then the Apostle Paul picks this up in the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul says, does not the Scripture say, cast out the bondwoman? Does not the Scripture say, cast out the bondwoman and her child? Hey, I thought all the Scripture came of holy men of old anointed by the Holy Ghost. But here's a scripture that came from a woman who had a revelation of the promised seed. According, God told Abraham, she's right. And Paul picks it up and says, does not the scripture say? God was speaking his word through Sarah after she had come in contact with God and God had visited her and she had an understanding of what this was. And what is this foreshadowing? It's showing, amen, that at the end time, amen, the word will be in the bride because she'll eat the book and prophesy again. And Brother Bram said she'll be the mouthpiece of God on earth for the word will be in her. All the way back in the Old Testament, male, female, male, Female. Moses. When it came time to bring Moses, God, for one, he needed a woman. 
He brought through, I believe his Jochebed was his mother's name, brought Moses on the scene. But at the time Moses came on the scene, there was a destruction of children. And so Jochebed hid Moses for a little while. And when she could hide him no longer, she fashioned a, a, an ark out of bulrushes and she put him in the bulrushes. So now, in order for God to move forward his redemption plan, he must save the life of Moses. But to save the life of Moses, he's gonna need a woman. This woman is going to make the ark that's going to hold the word, and she's going to send it into the bulrushes, amen? But then Moses' sister Miriam is going to follow along and watch what happens to the ark, another woman, amen? And then God is going to allow Pharaoh's daughter to find the ark, another woman. Listen, there's no men involved. This is all women, amen? It's his mother, it's his sister, amen? It's Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter takes him and adopts him as her own and brings him into Pharaoh's house. And what is God doing? God is moving the plan of redemption along. And I'm, I would like to say it this way. When you go back and you begin to look at the expressions of Christ, it was, Brother Brown said it was Christ and Moses. It was Christ and David. It was Christ here. It was Christ there. When you go back and you find Christ, Many times you'll find a woman instrumental in moving forward the redemption plan. That if you take the women out of the story, the plan of God cuts off. Why? Because he was showing that there's got to be a bride all the way back there. She's part of redemption. She's moving redemption along. God is still working through male and female. The Old Testament is the expression of Christ. He came as the fulfillment of that. Amen. As the bridegroom. The New Testament is building him a bride. But the whole Bible is an expression of Christ. And wherever you find Christ, his bride is there too. And that's why Brother Bram said, now my Bible became a new book. Our Bible's constantly becoming a new book because when we look at it again, we see that's Christ, that's the bride, that's what, this is redemption. Now little Miriam follows the basket along, sees Pharaoh, uh, uh, daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter uh, has a servant pick it up. She says this is one of the Hebrews. Miriam runs up and says, hey, do you want me to fetch a nursemaid to nurse him? She says, sure, gets her mother the mother of the baby. And she says, I'll pay you, I'll pay you to nurse your baby. It's the redemption plan of God. And you cannot see the redemption plan of God moving forward without a woman involved. Because the bride is part of Christ. She's part of the word. She's part of the plan of redemption. He's taken the mystery off the entire Bible. Now we come into the Exodus, come to Joshua. See, you look down through all of these stories, and as you look through them, the, at, at, first, at first Bible reading, you see Christ typed in male, 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 male. Moses, Joshua, David, Solomon. You got that? But when you go back and you read it again, you find that when it was time for Joshua to enter into the land, there was a stronghold there called Jericho. And when Joshua's moving into his ministry in the Exodus, and Joshua's a type of the Holy Ghost, and he's bringing the people across to conquer the land, the first thing they're going to conquer is that great denomination of Jericho. Amen. And it's got high walls around it. But there's a little prostitute woman down in Jericho by the name of Rahab. And Rahab is going to become instrumental into redemption in that city. So we think the story's just about Joshua, but when we're looking at Joshua, Rahab pops up. What's Rahab doing there? And then Rahab takes the two spies that come in to look at the land, amen, and then the spies were, uh, uh, they were after the spies, they were subject, uh, 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 they were in danger of being captured, amen, and their mission to be exposed, and so she takes them and hides them, and she declares, I don't have time to go into the scriptures today, but we might sometime soon, she declares, I know that God has given you this land. What is this? This is a harlot in the middle of the denominational system in Jericho. And she says, I know, I believe the message with all of my heart. Stuck in a lifestyle 
that is contrary to what we would call righteousness. I mean, she's in a bad spot, in a bad place, but there's something on the inside of her that when she heard of what God had done in the Red Sea and she heard of how he destroyed the armies, she said, that's the truth. God has given them this land. She hid the messengers, protected them, the, the, protected them. amen? But then she asked them, she said, listen, before you go, give me a true token. Give me a true token. And they tell her, you know, if you keep this secret and, and all that, and just set this scarlet thread outside of your window and get all your family under this token. And when you get all your family, we'll not destroy anything that's in this house, but we're not responsible for anything outside the token. And here you have a harlot woman in Jericho, believes the message, receives the preachers, protects them, and she opens a door of redemption, the only door of redemption in Jericho, in the accursed city, in the place that's about to be destroyed, in the very thing that Joshua's coming to level. Amen. There's a harlot on the inside who believes the message and acts accordingly, who is opening the only door of redemption in that cursed city. Praise God. Amen. We've been fools and slow of heart to believe all that God had written through the prophets and all that he read through the laws because he's always placed the woman instrumental in redemption all the way through. So now they take Jericho. Rahab comes out. Her and her family are saved. And then she marries Salmon of Judah. And she becomes the mother of Boaz. Listen, friends, tell me the bride's not in the Old Testament. The bride's in the Old Testament, amen. Where Christ is, she is, amen. There's male and female all the way through. Then a little while later, we come into the time of the judges, and in the time of the judges, we know that there's a, a famine, there's a family that leaves and goes to Moab, the sons marry daughters, amen, and they come back, and Naomi comes back with, uh, with who does she come back with? Ruth, thank you guys. Too many names. She comes back with Ruth, Ruth of Moabitess, amen? She's a Gentile. I mean, just look back into the Bible. Amen, when Joseph was a perfect type of Jesus Christ, what kind of wife did he have? Gentile wife. Moses had a Gentile wife, right? You're starting to see this pattern all through the Bible. God has been declaring his great mystery in every type. Every type in the Bible has been declaring it. He's been slowly letting it out. But at the end time, he takes the veil off so you can go back and say, that's why Joseph had to have a Gentile wife. That's why Moses had to marry a Gentile. This makes perfect sense. Because he's taken the veil off of redemption. And it's Christ, male and female. So now we come. Now we come into Boaz. And Boaz is going to be a picture of the kinsman redeemer. And he's going to paint the picture for us of how Christ will redeem it all the way through to Revelation chapter 5. So he's another type of Christ. But... He's an, he, he, from all accounts, he's an older man from the way the scripture's written. And there's, a, there's a, a, a woman by the name of Naomi and their relatives, Naomi, she loses everything, goes into the Moab and, and they lose everything there. She comes back and lost her husband, lost her sons, lost her inheritance. She needs redemption real bad, amen? But how is this woman gonna get redemption? Boaz is able to redeem her, amen? But God is going to use a mechanism so that it's not only the male, but it's going to be the female because now Ruth is going to be instrumental to Naomi's redemption. Now this woman from Moab, Moab, the Moabitish woman, the Gentile bride, is coming on the scene, and through humility and service, amen, she's going to serve Naomi, she's going to glean in the fields, she's going to get the attention of Boaz, and Boaz is now going to redeem Naomi and take Ruth, and when he takes Ruth, she's going to bring forth a promised son, that is Obed, Obed's the father of Jesse, Jesse's the father of David. How did they come about? Because Rahab the harlot opened a door of redemption, and 
Jericho married Salmon because she was a believer in the midst of the denominational system, married the prince, had Boaz. Boaz takes Ruth, the Moabitish woman, for the purpose of redemption, brings forth Obed. Obed brings Jesse. Jesse brings forth David. The Bible's too perfect, too beautiful, friends, for us to miss it anymore. I say, God, take the scales off of our eyes and see what's been hiding in plain sight. In plain sight, there's been a woman all the way through in redemption. It wasn't the male only, but you used a woman. You used a woman here, and you used a woman there, and you used a woman there. And then this day, amen, it's the bride coming of Christ. You're finishing the plan of redemption, and you're using a female expression of Christ. How can I have such confidence in that? I can see it strung clear through the Bible, amen. I have confidence that that's what God is wanting to do. We're on the road to Emmaus. We find on here, running out of room, but you find Esther. And Esther opens a a door of salvation for an entire people, a nation of Israel. And without her, amen, she's in place for salvation. She's instrumental to the salvation of the Jews. I'm gonna go down here and add another one. I'm gonna add Deborah. Deborah was a judge and a prophetess. She was the fourth judge in the fourth chapter. I think God wants us to see the number four. Because the fourth stage of the seed is back to life again and the fourth beast is the eagle. And the eagle is the prophetic anointing. And she's from the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim is a type of the Gentiles because when God crossed, when he crossed um, Jacob's hands, Israel's hands, Amen, the blessing went across from uh, Manasseh into Ephraim, showing that the blessing went across from the Jews to the Gentiles. So here comes a woman who's a prophetess, a woman who's a judge, and she's the fourth judge in the fourth chapter from, because the number four is the fourth beast, which is also the eagle, the the prophetic gift, and she's from the tribe of Ephraim, which represents Gentiles. I wonder what she's doing there. I wonder why God put her in the Bible. Maybe, maybe like Brother, Brother Shimba was saying, God was using David, he was leaving a signal. He says, here's the signal. Remember when Brother Shimba said that? He was signaling the combination of Judah and Levite back into one again. And here God and this Deborah is leaving a signal. I've told you all before, I used to, when I used to uh, talk, I used to debate, it wasn't right, but I did debate. I had the right word. I used to debate with denominational people about women preachers. And they would always go to Deborah, and I would say, why did God, if God hadn't put that in the Bible, my debate would have lasted a little longer. (laughs) But then God opened our eyes to see why it's laying there, and all of a sudden you say, I'm so thankful he put Deborah in the Bible so that I can see in the end time, amen, under a prophetic ministry, God is going to have a woman on the earth, amen, at, the, at, the, at Ephraim in the fourth stage of the beast, amen, and when it comes back to life, amen, and the word is going to be in her, amen, the word that the prophet brought is going to be in the bride. She's going to be told to prophesy again. So now all of these things are laying in the Bible. You know, in the time of Judges, in the time of Deborah, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to give a couple more and then we'll, we'll, we'll close for today. But in the time of Deborah, amen, there's a battle that's taking place. The Canaanites are ruling and dominating over the Israelites, and, and she tells Barak to go and defeat them, and Barak wants her to come, and then she tells him, but there's going to be credit given to a woman for this victory, amen. And under the time of Deborah, the prophetess, the judge, the fourth, amen, there's a, there's a captain of the host of the, 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 the conquering army. His name's Sisera. And Sisera is giving them all kinds of trouble, and, and Barak is trying to thwart them and, and save the, the Israelite nation, and Sisera begins to run away, and when he runs away, he runs to a woman's tent. And this woman invites him in, and she comes into the woman's tent, 
And he asks for water. She gives him milk. And, and she tells him to lie down back here. And she covers him over. And he says, protect me. And she says, I'll protect you. And when he falls asleep, she takes a tent stake. This big, this big, maybe this big. She walks over to him and lays it on his temple and drives the tent stake through his head, through his temple, and pins it to the ground. Amen. The enemy comes into the woman's tent. And where does she attack the enemy? Where does she defeat the enemy? In the mind. Because the battle started in the mind. The serpent came to Eve and troubled her in her mind. And now we have a victory under the ministry of Deborah. And under the ministry of Deborah, the final victory that's going to give them victory over all the foes is when this woman takes this tent stake and drives it through the very thinking, the very mind of this enemy and pins it to the ground as earthly carnal thinking and she won't be defeated by this enemy anymore. Why is that in the Bible? I don't know. Maybe to encourage you and I. There's another story in, in Judges chapter 9. In Judges chapter 9, it's, it's Ahimelech or Abimelech, amen, is a son of Gideon. Gideon was a judge over Israel. He has a son with a concubine, so it's not a legitimate son. It's an illegitimate son. And this a little illegitimate son, amen, comes up with a scheme so he can become the next judge of Israel. And through this political maneuvering and scheme, he becomes the false judge. And this false judge begins to terrorize and, and begins to control. And, and then there's a war that breaks out and there's a fight. And, and he defeats one city and he goes to the next. When he goes to the next, all the people run up into a tower. Because we have a tower to run into, which is Christ. All the people run into the tower when the, when the false judge is coming along, the, the hybrid one. He's coming in. And he begins to attack and he begins to set fire to it. But there's a woman at the top of that tower that takes a piece of millstone. <laughs> she takes a piece of stone and throws it out of the strong tower. And the stone comes down and cracks him in the head and fractures his skull. Listen, you could write that story any way you want. But for me... There's a strong tower that this bride can go into. And when the enemy comes beating on the tower, I've got a revelation I can roll off the top and that revelation will knock him right in the head and crack his skull. Break the very thing. It's always the thinking, the mind, the reasoning, the earthly carnal thinking that's always attacking this bride. So back there in Judges, amen, she drives a spike through the thinking. She rolls a stone out, a revelation, and cracks him in the head. I say, praise God, when we look down through the Bible, I can see, amen, I can see a woman, I can see a woman of redemption, I can see victory, I can see myself. In this resurrection ministry, he opened the scriptures, but he also opened our understanding to understand the scriptures. When we look back down through the scriptures, we can see the bride. But when we look down through the scriptures, we can see the groom, I mean. And when we see the groom, we can see the bride too. God has been working a plan. And in that plan, he's been expressing himself. And every character in the Bible, and all the types and the shadows and the stories, it's all been him expressing this great plan he had in his mind. And it's been sealed away from the wise and prudent, but revealed unto babes. And we've come to the day where the Bible's become a new book. He's taken and taken the seals off of the book, and we can look back down through, and we can say, I see Christ there, I see Christ there, I see Christ there. But I see he's using a woman, too. There's a woman there, and a woman there, and a woman there. When you come into the New Testament, the first person that ever knows that this time for the coming of the Lord is a woman, Mary. The first person that knows, the, 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 the first two women to meet, one that's carrying the forerunner and one that's carrying what he's forerunning, they come together, and when they come together, the Holy Ghost takes over and they both begin to prophesy. Two women, right there at the beginning of the New Testament. The, the first person in Samaria that recognizes he's the Messiah is the woman at the well. 
I mean, it was a woman who recognized that he needed to be anointed with oil for his burial. It was a woman. His disciples were all sitting there, and they all said, what waste? And he says, she has anointed me for my burial. And wherever this gospel goes, it will be spoken of her. What did she do? She caught the revelation of the hour and the manifestation in the need. And all the disciples and the priests, everything else missed it, but a woman caught it. Amen. The first person that he talked to, the first person that he saw in his resurrection was Mary Magdalene, who had cast seven devils out. He didn't cast six, he didn't cast eight, he cast seven. Because in this resurrection, there's a woman who's been delivered from the seven denominations, the seven church ages. And he comes to her in this resurrection, and he reveals his resurrection to her. I tell you, this Bible is perfect. God has showed us this message all through it. It's not a few scriptures in Revelation. It's not a few scriptures here or there. What Brother Branham brought to us, amen, in the opening of the seals, he took the seals off the entire, the Lord Jesus took the seals off the entire Bible. The book has been opened, and now we can go back with fresh eyes and look at all those stories that we knew as children, and we see them differently. We used to see them. Now we see the mystery being unveiled. Now we see the plan of redemption moving forward. And I say, God, give us eyes to see This hour that we're living in, this expression that we're called to in this hour, it's not something that's just happening on the side or on the sidelines. This has been God's plan from before the foundation of the world. I said, God, be it unto me according to your word. I believe it, Lord. I may not be able to produce it. I may not have uh, all... All my thinking right, all my actions may not line up, but Lord, I believe it with all my heart. Just like Mary believed the voice of that angel, I believe the voice of this angel. And I want to say, be it unto me. Let me embrace it, Lord, and become one with it. And let me in the message become the same. Now I don't want to walk through life trying to get somebody to a doctrine. I want to bring somebody in contact with a person. Amen. God bless you. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you could come, please. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the privilege, Lord, of being here. Looking down through your Bible, Lord, taking another walk on the road to Emmaus, as it were, to see, Lord, that you've laid this mystery down all through the Bible. God, it's not something that was done just in one section or one part. But this come from your mind, Lord. And when you expressed your mind, you wrote this mystery in the heavens. You wrote it in the pyramid. You wrote it in this Bible. And at the end of time, Lord, you've come yourself. You used a vessel of clay, a prophet of God, to express to us this great mystery that you had in your mind. And now, Lord, we go back and we see that the mystery's been hiding in plain view. Father, I pray that you would just open our eyes and open our understanding. May we look again with fresh eyes, with fresh perspective, and may we see you in every jot, in every tittle, in every line. And may the mystery become so real to us, Lord, that we just manifest it, just live it. May we love you more and more and embrace you closer and closer, Lord. We love you, Father. We ask that you would help us, Lord. Help us to see, help us to understand. God, I pray that you be with your people and that you would bless us as we go from here. May you guide us, Lord, every day, and may we become the expression that you desire in this hour. Lord, we know that no matter what we want, Lord, or how bad we want it, there is something that you've wanted before the foundation of the world. There's a plan you had a desire, and by faith we believe we're part of that plan, Lord. God, help us to yield in a greater way. Help us to surrender more and more, Lord, that you might come in and take more control. That you might have the preeminence in us, Lord, and express yourself in us. We love you, Father, and ask, Lord, that you would allow your grace to work in our lives. Allow us to surrender. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. And God bless you. We're going to come back for communion and feet washing at 4 p.m. So if you can... Return for that then, we'd appreciate it. I also want to say, 
God bless you, Arlene. It's good to see you. We've been praying for you and glad to see you in service. And we'll continue to be holding you up in prayer. Man, God bless you. Let's sing. Be it unto